Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon ladies and gentlemen. Shalom, om swastiastu, namo buddhaya, salam kebajikan. To the honorable rector of Universitas Trisakti, Professor Dr. Insinyur Kadar Sasuryadi DEA, the honorable speakers, Professor Manuel Frank from France, as the Professor of Geography in Alco Southeast Department, and Dr. Nathalie Langhe from France as the CNRS Research Director and member of the Inalco Research Center for Southeast Asia, to the Honorable All Vice Rectors of Universitas Trisakti, the Honorable Head and Secretary Senate of Faculty Civil Engineering and Planning Universitas Trisakti, the Honorable Dean of Faculty Civil Engineering and Planning Universitas Trisakti, Dr. Insinyur Ahadi Prabowo MT. The Honorable <laughs> Vice Dean One, Faculty Civil Engineering and Planning Universitas Trisakti, Dr. Insinyur Popi Puspita Sari MT. The Honorable Vice Dean Two, Faculty Civil Engineering and Planning Universitas Trisakti, Mrs. Insinyur Khotijah Lahji MT. The Honorable Vice Dean Three, Faculty Civil Engineering and Planning, Universitas Trisakti, Mr. Rafles, STMT. The Honorable Vice Dean Four, Faculty Civil Engineering and Planning, Universitas Trisakti, Dr. Lisa Oxrinelvia, ST Master Engineering. The Honorable Deans and Vice Deans Interfaculties of Universitas Trisakti. The Honorable Director of Research and Community Service, Universitas Trisakti, or the Representative. The Honorable Director of International Office of Culture and Cooperation, Universitas Trisakti, or the Representative. The Honorable All Directors and Head of Bureau of Universitas Trisakti. The Honorable Moderator, Dr. Retna Ayu Puspatarini, STMT. The Honorable Head of Department, Secretary Department, Assistant of Vice Dean Three, Lecturers and Students in Faculty of Civil Engineering and Planning, and Interfaculties of Universitas Trisakti. So welcome to International Guest Lecture that proudly presents by Faculty of Civil Engineering and Planning, Universitas Trisakti. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. So my name is Prayang Sani. It is such an honor for me for become the MC for International Guest Lecture. All right, so this event is held on C Building Auditorium FTSP Universitas Trisakti on Thursday, 6th of April, 2023. Ladies and gentlemen, in order to run this event properly and always be blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let us pray together. And for the prayer, we'll be led by Mr. Arif Fadilah, STMD. Please welcome, time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon and greetings to all of us. Ladies and gentlemen, let us bow our heads for a moment and pray to God. And those who are with other religions, you are pleased to pray according to your own beliefs. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahirabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in. In the name of Allah, most gracious, most merciful. Praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Peace and blessings are upon our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his companions and for those who followed his example till the judgment day. O oh Allah, on this blessed time, along with the international guest lecture, a talk on the pattern of urbanization, urbanization in Indonesia and the, and the heritage of ordinary city in Southeast Asia 
we beg and are grateful towards you in favor of all the infinite blessings to us to live safe and prosperous life. We seek your blessing for a flawless of this event from the beginning till the end. O oh Allah, with your blessing, make this event a useful science assembly as a medium for as a medium for sharing useful ideas, knowledge, and experiences, especially in our academic and scientific cooperation. O oh Allah, please bless us with your tawfiq and hidayah. Please guide our, our university, our institution, to greatness, glory, and prosperity. Make us responsible intellectuals. We beg your grant for valuable knowledge that will be beneficial to our, our environment and civilization. Make us your right to servant that follow your commands and neglect the sinful act. O oh Allah, you are the one who can fulfill our dua. Subhanaka la ilmalana illa ma alamtana. We have no knowledge except what you have taught us. Innaka antal alimul hakim. You are truly the all-knowing, always. Rabbana atina fid dunya hasanah. Wa fil akhirati hasanah. Wa kina azaban nar. Sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alim. Terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Mr. Arif Fadila. All right, ladies and gentlemen, for the following agenda, let us sing our national anthem, Indonesia Raya, and followed by the national anthem of Frank, La Marseille and followed by March of Faculty, Civil Engineering and Planning, Universitas Trisakti. Please all rise.
Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated. For the forthcoming agenda, this is the opening speech by the Dean of Faculty, Civil Engineering and Planning, Universitas Trisakti. Please welcome Dr. Insinyur Ahadi Prabowo, MT. Time is yours. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. The Honorable Profesor Dr. Insinyur Kadarsa Suryadi DE, Rektor of Trisakti University. Thank you, Pak Rektor. Uh, have come to FTSP Faculty. And Honorable Profesor Manuel Frank, Professor of Geography, Geography uh, in Alco, Southeast Asia Department in France. And then, Honorable Dr. Natalie Lansred, CNRS Research Director and member of the Inalco Research Center for Southeast Asia, France. And then Honorable uh, Dean and Vice Dean at Trisakti University, maybe in a Zoom meeting. And then Honorable, uh, my colleague, uh, the Vice Dean, Head of the Study Program and Secretary of Study Program at the Faculty of Civil Engineering and Planning. And ladies and gentlemen, lecture in Trisakti University and FTSP Environment lecture and uh, invited guests maybe in online or in offline. And uh, I'm proud of Trisakti University's undergraduate and master student. First of all, we thank the presence of the Allah, the Almighty God, that today we can attend a guest a lecture uh, entitled The Pattern of Urbanization in Indonesia and the Heritage of Ordinary City in Southeast Asia, which will be delivered by Prof. Manuel and Prof. Natalie. Speaking of urbanization, is a movement of population from rural area to cities. Urbanization is very large number can have a very bad impact in various ways, such as limited housing, city are increasingly crowded and traffic uh, jam occur. The, emer the emerging of slum settlement. So it's necessary to make equal development effort in rural area, profit various from of the new job. Meanwhile, the heritage of ordinary city is related to the implementation of conservation activities for city that have not been distinguished as heritage on a international scale. The implementation of preservation is used to maintain local value and city identity. Distinguished audience guest lecture activity as part of improving the quality of education by gaining knowledge from experts who are competent in this field. It is hoped that this activity can be expanded into collaborative joint lecture, joint research, 
joint scientific publication and student exchange. Thus, it can also expand to international network as one of the required in order to achieve an international reputation ftsp has planned cooperation with educational research and business institution lecturer and student it is hoped that the case lecture activities will provide insight to all us about urbanization and heritage to find out more, you can discuss it with it, uh, it with the speakers so that the understanding will be clear and develop into additional insight. Welcome to the guest lecture. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Bapak Hadi, as the Dean of FTSP Universitas Trisakti. And for the following agenda, this is the opening speech and continue with official opening ceremony by the Rector of Universitas Trisakti. Please welcome to Professor Dr. Insinyur Kadarsa Suryadi, DEA. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, Honorable Le Professor Manuel Frank, Honorable Dr. Natalie Langre, Honorable Vice Rector, maybe in the online. The deans, especially the deans of STSP, Dr. Hadi Prabowo, all of the vice deans, head of departments, and my colleagues or lecturers, and also my awesome students. It is great pleasure for me to be here with all of you, and I would like to express my warm welcome, especially to Professor Manuel Frank and Dr. Natalie Langre. And I would like to appreciate to the both of our guest lecturer, Professor Frank and Dr. Langre. You have spent your precious time the very from far away from France. I know that if I go to, from Jakarta to Paris, it needs long, long journey, eight hours from Jakarta to Abu Dhabi and seven hours from Abu Dhabi to Paris, plus the transit for or five hours. So the total is almost 20 hours in the travel. So once again, thanks so much for coming to Industry Sakti. And today, as pa Hadi Prabowo mentioned that we have the guest lecture from our honorable guest lectures. And I would like to inform to Professor Frank and Dr. Natalie that uh, Universitas Trisakti has some international policies, some are dimensioned by Pak Hadi. Among them are, we participate in international ranking of universities such as QS ranking, and some of our study programs participate in international accreditation. The objective is the first of all to have the international standard, to conduct international standard in our university. The second is to conduct the continuous improvement based on international standard. And the third is the most important is to have international recognition to our communities and also to our alumni. Another international policy is to conduct the joint research, joint supervision, and also double degree program 
for example, for a master program, the student one year in university Sakti and one year in abroad. And at the end of study, the student has two diplomas coming from the both sides. Another international policy is to have the student exchange. Student exchange is very important because it allows to have the international or intercultural cross cross cultural intersection. It means that we prepare our young students and our young students also in our partner to connect each other since the very beginning. Why? Because in the future, maybe they become the leaders in each country and it will facilitate the connection before or since today to prepare their journey in the future as the leader in each country. The next international policy is to have the staff exchange because by staff exchange, we have opportunity to enrich the knowledge of our staff. And also when the staff from abroad come to Tisakti, it can give atmosphere to our university community. The next international policy is to have or to conduct the guest lecture. And today we have the guest lecture. Will be delivered by Professor Prang and Dr. Natalie Lankre. I hope that all of our academic staff, students, all audience, to profit this opportunity to increase our insight because I'm sure that Professor Prang and Dr. Lankre have many insight, many experience, many knowledge that can enrich our knowledge and to increase our quality. And I would like to deliver my sincere thanks, Professor Frank and Dr. Nankre, for coming to University of Trisakti and for sharing your idea, your knowledge and insight. Ladies and gentlemen, Allow me to speak in French to our honorable guest, Professor Manuel Franks and Dr. Natalia Andre. Je suis très honoré de d'avoir votre présence here, ici. And je voudrais exprimer Mon merci for the both of for uh, Fuder, for Fuder. Because for the presence of the Sakti, for me, for Nutus, the war, and the richer, not reconnaissance, especially concerning urbanization, architect, etc. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes ensemble here, ici pour écouter votre explication. En espérant, nous tous, nous tous avons the uh, the la connaissance plus pointu plus en plus large et encore une fois ça nous permet d'enrichir notre connaissance et notre expérience merci beaucoup et je voudrais vous exprimer notre sentiment respectueux Ladies and gentlemen, at the end of my speech, I would like to tell you and to uh, give you my aspiration. Hopefully, this seminar 
give all of us the very, very fruitful, the very, very fruitful knowledge, experience, experience and insight. And at the end of my speech, I would like to declare that the guest lecture today officially open. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Kadarsa, as Director of Universitas Trisakti. And for the following one, this is the token of a pre and giving to our honorable speaker. Therefore, for the first one, we'd like to invite Professor Manuel Frank and also Professor Kadarsa Suryadi for the token of appreciation giving. Okay, so for the first token that will be received by Professor Manuel and will be given by Professor Kadarsa. Thank you very much. Okay, so for the next one, we'd like to invite Dr. Nathalie and Dr. Hadi Prabowo to conduct the token of appreciation giving. Okay, and continue with photo session. Uh, excuse me. Yes, to have the photo session, maybe for yeah, our honorable speaker on the center. Yes, please. Yeah. Okay, and we'd like also invite uh, the all vice deans and then head of uh, department, secretary department of FTSP. Please welcome. And also uh, the representative of LPPM Universitas Trisakti. And have you wrote, uh, Pak Ali, head of Kabama, yeah, head of Bama. Okay, one more time, and gentlemen, please, with the background of our participants. So, yes, yeah, we may move aside for a while. Yeah. <laughs> so, all the participants can also in frame in uh, this session. Maybe, uh, yeah, would you please do step back for a little bit? Okay, step, just step back. Okay, please, Mas Dwi from Humas. Okay. Um, do they need to get up or all right, please to all students <laughs> and participants. Boleh bagit berdiri, so please all rise. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. You all may heading back to your seat.
Thank you very much to Bapak Rektor Universitas Trisakti, Professor Kadar Sasriadi. You are allowed to continue for the next important agenda. Thank you very much and we really appreciate for the attendance. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, so now we are heading into the main agenda. So we'd like to invite our moderator and the other speakers. So first, please welcome to our moderator, Ibu Dr. Retna Ayu Puspatarini, STMT. Please welcome, give a plus, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, thank you. And for the next one, we'd like to invite our first honorable speaker. Please welcome to Professor Manuel Frank. Please give applause, ladies and gentlemen. And also, we'd like to invite our honorable speaker, Dr. Nathalie Lange. Please give applause, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so we have our moderator and our speakers here. And before that, please allow us to introduce our moderator, Dr. Retna, by reading her curriculum vitae. Dr. Retna Ayu Puspatarini, STMT. Her education background, she had graduated as Doctor of Architecture from Institute Technology of 10 November and graduated as Master of Architecture from Institute Technology Bandung and graduated as Bachelor of Architecture from Universitas Taruma Nagara. Currently, Dr. Retna is working as permanent lecturer at Faculty Civil Engineering and Planning Universitas Trisakti, and also she's the Secretary Department Master Program of Architecture. And prior her work now, she was also the guest lecturer at Podomoro University, a culture advisor for International Shadow Puppet Organization, freelance architect and non-permanent lecturer at Universitas Taruman Negara. She has many experiences on research project and architectural experiences spanning national and international, and also has many publications both in national and international journals. So without further ado, please welcome to Dr. Retna. Time is yours. Thank you, Ibu Prayang. <clears throat> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, distinguished guests, uh, Professor Manuel Frank and Dr. Natalie Rangke. Honorable guests, our lec uh, lecturer, Professor Dr. Insinyur Kadarsa Suryadi, and Vice Rectors, uh, Director of Institute of Research and Community Service, Director International Office of Cultural and Cooperation, Head and Secretary Senate of Faculty Civil Engineering. Uh, our Dean, Dr. Insinyur Hadi uh, Prabowo, MT, and Vice Deans of Faculty of Civil Engineering, Dean and Vice Deans of uh, Universitas Risakti, uh, lecturers of Faculty of Civil Engineering and Planning, and lecturers from other faculties within Universitas Risakti, uh, of course, uh, our students, and ladies and gentlemen, whom I cannot say one by one. Welcome to our today's event, International Guest Lecture, discussion on the pattern of urbanization in Indonesia and the heritage of ordinary city in Southeast Asia held by Faculty of Civil Engineering and Planning. This event consists of lectures from two speakers, then we continue the session question and answered. Each presentation will be held for 30 minutes. We hope that after hearing the lectures, we will have interesting discussion to explore, especially their concern on our Indonesia. As mentioned earlier by our MC, I am Ratnayu Buspatarini. Today, we'll direct and facilitate today's event. Before we, uh, before we start, uh, we'll, I would like to present a curriculum vitae of uh, both of our speakers. Um, <clears throat> first, Oops, sorry. Uh, uh, Mas Rizal, CV, Manuel Frank.
Terima kasih. Man, uh, Manuel Frank uh, graduated from um, uh, Professor Manuel Frank uh, uh, has finished his uh, her PhD in geography of University Party uh, uh, One Sorbonne, and then completes uh, her master degree in history and also geography in University Party One Sorbonne, and then the uh, has had the, her diploma superior of contemporary eastern asia uh, from inalco pari and she's currently a lecturer of in inalco specialized in geography of southeast asia uh, her interests of the research on uh, research on urbanization process metropoli metropolization metropolization process secondary cities research in regional geography of Southeast Asian countries and on regional integration in Pacific Asia. Outside her uh, education field, she is also a director of the Department of Southeast Asia, Himalaya, South Pacific, <clears throat> and then director of the doctoral studies, and also uh, was uh, president uh, of INALCO, uh, in to, until 2019 right okay and has published uh, many of uh, publications uh, okay and for series for dr natalie lancre uh, have her education for phd uh, in urban studies from ahs pari and then for master in architecture, uh, in, in Ecole d'Architecture de Paris Bellevue, so, and then uh, got her diploma, diploma superior in urban studies at Hes Paris. And her position also, uh, she's a researcher since 2012 in French National Center for Scientific Research, and her interest for research themes on contemporary development of cities in Southeast Asia, urban heritage politics, heritage mm -hmm. of city, conservation and tr transmission of heritage by communities. And she published uh, many uh, publications. Okay, so without further ado, uh, well, the first speaker, uh, Manuel Frank, s'il vous plaît. Merci beaucoup. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Adi, the Dean of uh, the Faculty of Architecture, the Vice Dean and all colleagues here lecturing and professors from, from Trisakti. And thank you also to the, the, the students coming to listen to us today. Um, so I'll, um, my presentation, so should I share my screen or, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how it works with Zoom, but I can share this one. Yeah, I think, I think it's all right. Yeah. Okay. Um, my, my lecture today is, is quite a kind of uh, short introduction to to contemporary urbanization in, in Indonesia, as uh, well, we were told that maybe many students from a SATU degree would, would attend. So it's kind of introduction. And then uh, Nathalie uh, Lancre will then uh, go forward with some of the special uh, topics. I'm sorry, to, I'm trying to, to put my, <laughs> yeah, okay, not so that I'm not too long. Um, of course, uh, urbanization has not begun in Indonesia during these contemporary uh, uh, times because it's a very old phenomena, but I will not go into the detail today. Um, okay. Next. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. 
So this is kind of also, I, I'd like to begin with the kind of uh, methodological point about studying uh, urbanization and, and cities in Indonesia. So I'm sorry for my colleagues, uh, professors and lecturers, because this is really the beginning for you, but still, I think if we if we need to, to study about urbanization anywhere, including Indonesia, but also anywhere, you have to be aware of some methodological uh, issues to take uh, to be taken into account. And the first one, which would be the definition and the limits of the cities we are talking about. So this would be maybe a first step. So I suppose you know much more than I do about Indonesian cities and Indonesian uh, definition, but when we study cities, we must be aware about the, the definition of cities. So in Indonesia, there are various uh, definitions, but the one which allows to, to count the number of urban uh, people or the, um, the number of uh, population for a city, you need to know what the, the criteria, the statistical criteria are used. So in Indonesia, the, the definition has been evolving over time which makes it very difficult to compare the situation of urbanization of Indonesia from time to time. The time series is very difficult because it, uh, the definition has changed. And Indonesian definition is very interesting because it's been more and more detailed over time, taking into account really the, the nature of uh, urbanization. When the census, the BPs, I'm using the, the BPS, Pusat statistic definition. And in the 1960s, the definition was more simple. It was about 80% of the population, which is uh, a non-agricultural activity. And then also all the DESA, which were considered as urban, were those included in the limits of, uh, of municipalities. But there were very few municipalities at that time, and also in Kabupaten capital. And then the definition has been evolving, 71, 80, to 2000. And each time it's, it's been much more detailed. And also there's been the introduction of the concept of urban facilities. The question is to differentiate between rural DESA and urban DESA. And to help uh, defining urban DESA, the, the concept of urban facility has been introduced in the 1971. A DESA was considered as urban if the DESA was within the, the quota boundaries, but also if there was at least three urban facilities, which at that time were hospitals, schools, and electricity, and also still the criteria of non-agricultural activity. And then the census 1980 introduced more uh, urban facilities, eight out of a list of 13. And then the census 2000 has introduced a new concept about the distance of the facility from the DESA. So all these criteria, which has been evolved, allow uh, statisticians and ourselves also to, to, to determine how many urban population in Indonesia and how many uh, the population of the city. So this is the criteria since 2000, which is still going uh, uh, in 2020. So you see that there is a, a kind of score system. Uh, if the highest the population density and the highest the person, percentage of agricultural household, the highest the score from one to eight. And then also about the urban facilities, the 13 urban facilities, then if the, uh, the facility exists in the DESA, the score is one, and if it's more than 2.5 kilometers away, then the score is null. So if you count all the scores, uh, the scores is more than 10, you, the DESA is considered as urban, and if it's under 10, it's considered as rural. So in Indonesia, the urban population, the, the number is uh, based on this, uh, this kind of definition. And it is a very detailed definition because if we look at uh, other countries' definition, and spe especially uh, some uh, Southeast Asian definition, neighboring countries' definition, you see that in Malaysia, the definition is much more, much more simple. Uh, an urban desa, which is not a desa, it's a muking, so it's more like a kecamatan, yeah? 
the 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 definition is only when it's it reaches ten thousand inhabitants and it, it's considered as urban. So th this is one of the explanations of the high level of urbanization in Malaysia. There are also other explanations, but the the definition is very wide. Uh, in Thailand, for instance, until 2000, the only criteria was an administrative criteria. The DESA was to be within municipality boundaries, and then it was automatically considered as urban, even though all the population was agriculture uh, activity, or even if the, 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 the landscape was very rural. So this is an administrative criteria. Now the definition has been uh, upgraded, of course, in Thailand, but until 2000, it was the only one that was used. And then with the two other examples, you have combination of criteria. The Philippine one is uh, quite complicated because it's a mix of administrative criteria and then population criteria, but uh, barrios, this is the DESA in, in the Philippines, the barrios. Oh, yeah, you can see my arrow. <laughs> the barrios is... Um, uh, if uh, it is uh, contiguous to uh, Kota Madia or Kota, then it's considered as urban if it's only 1,000 inhabitants. So you see, every country has its own definition according to the aim, the objective of defining the city, because it's not the same if you want to count the population, not the same if you want to maybe prepare for infrastructures, or not the same if you need to maybe collect pajak, yeah. <laughs> so the definitions is also according the needs of the definition. Let me show you the French one, I'm French. And you see that the French one is very simple, but it's based on the morphological criteria and not population, uh, population also, but not activity. So an urban DESA or urban unit is a DESA or a group of DESA with a continuous build up area. That means that there not, mustn't be breaks of more than 200 meters between two buildings. This is the French definition. It's a, a, a question of concentration of build, buildings. And also, of course, 2000 inhabitants because the population must be quite high. So, this short uh, explanation on, only to, to, to make you aware that cross-country and time series comparison are very difficult and you must be aware that the definition changes from times to times and from country to country. So I'm using uh, statistical data from the UN, for instance, the UN uses the national definitions. So if the definition is different, it is difficult to compare. We only have to be aware when we are studying or we are, when we are doing research also, really. Second uh, methodological problem is the limits of a city. Where are the limits of the cities? So how many inhabitants in the city? Well, it depends on the limits you're taking it in, into account. This is a, a map of urban DESA in Jawa in 2020, uh, prepared by uh, BPS uh, statistics from Indonesia. So you see Jakarta, this is DKY Jakarta. Huh? You know more about, about me, but you see that it ex expands in very largely uh, over the boundaries of DKY uh, I Jakarta. And also the Bandung city is very huge. Maybe let's skip to the central Java, go to East Java. And you see that in East Java, there's kind of continuous building uh, environment uh, from Surabaya along all the Brantas Valley and from Surabaya to Malang. So if we count the population of Surabaya, what should we count all this, only this, only this? Yes, you can do what you want, whatever you want. It depends on what you're researching on, what, what is the aim of uh, counting. So here, I don't have time, you, do, you know that more than I am, that uh, this is DKY Jakarta is 10 million inhabitants. And if you go up to Jabodetabek, it's almost 30 million inhabitants, but all the population, not the population, only in urban DESA. You must be aware also, when I say 30 million inhabitants, this is the inhabitants in, of all Jabodetabek, but in Jabodetabek, some of the DESA do not correspond to the criteria or urban DESA. Still some few, very few now, but still some. But even though I count the 
population for all the DESAs, because I didn't have time to, you know, <laughs> just uh, count exactly. So when we compare uh, capital cities uh, from Indonesia to Thailand, for instance, oh, Jakarta is much bigger than Bangkok, 30, 30 million. Yes, but it depends on the boundaries, because in Bangkok also you have different boundaries, so you never know what you compare. So the inner, what we could call the inner city, Bangkok Met Metropolitan Administration is also about 10 million inhabitants. So it's the same than DKI Jakarta. So, But if you go to this um, Bangkok uh, Metropolitan Region, which is Bangkok and the five provinces uh, around Bangkok, then you have uh, 16 million inhabitants. So then Indonesia is more people than the... The metropolitan area of Jakarta is uh, more people than in, in Bangkok. So we must compare what is comparable. That's a methodological uh, point. Um, well, let's turn now to the level and pattern of uh, urbanization in, in Indonesia, if I may. Uh, the, here you have a graphic of the evolution of the rural population, this pink one, and the urban population, this red, more dark one, from 1950 to 2050. This is a projection, of course. Huh? And it's being prepared by uh, you and, uh, and uh, Urbanet. So you see here the rural population, which has been growing until the 1990, and now it's declining. And the urban population is growing much faster and it, it will continue to grow faster. Until now, there's about 55% of, of urban population in Indonesia, according to Indonesian definition that I mentioned just before. I don't have too much time to, to detail this, uh, this table, but it is for uh, every population census, the number of urban population, rural population, total and percent urban, percent rural. But what is more interesting is the rate of growth of urban and rural population. And we can see that the urban population always grow faster than the rural one. So there is a rapid process of urbanization in uh, Indonesia. That is only what is shown here in this table. If we uh, compare a little bit with uh, neighboring countries, uh, the world average for urban population, this was in uh, 2018, the latest available uh, data from UN, uh, the uh, world average was 55.3%. The developed countries average was 78.7, .7, developing country 50.6, and Asia was 50, all Asia, including China, Japan, and so it's 50%. And Indonesia is a little bit above the average of Southeast Asia, which is 49, which was 49 in 2018. And also here we see the evolution of uh, the, the percentage of urban population from 1960 to, to, to until today. And you see for Southeast Asia also the, the growing, the, the rates of increase of urban population is also quite, quite rapid. But there are very huge differences between countries uh, for their percent of urban population. It is linked to the definition of each country, but mostly it is linked to its economic dynamics and this Roughly, we, we considered that it's also linked to the level of development. So here are the, we can say the poorest cities of Southeast, the poorest uh, countries of Southeast Asia, and also they entered globalization lately because of political systems, because of war. And here you see Indonesia, which is 55%. So Indonesia is one of the most, more, uh, most urbanized uh, country of Southeast Asia, except for Malaysia, which is more industrialized, and also the definition allows very large number of uh, people to be counted as urban. And then, of course, Singapore is 100% because it's a city and a, a state city. This is the map for uh, cities of more than 5,000 
500,000 inhabitants in 2018. So you have the map of all uh, Southeast Asian countries. And uh, I suppose that if we had time and, and I would give you the, the need to comment the map, you would say, oh, what the big red circle means, because this is of course what we see first, uh, the very huge size, big size of the capital cities. May, be, may there be in continental Southeast Asia, this is Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, Cambodia, and here it's Laos, but also in uh, what we call island Southeast Asia or maritime Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Philippines, uh, and Singapore, of course. So you see the capital cities, we have a, a phenomena of what we call the primacy of the capital cities, which means a kind of over concentration of population, of activities, of also economic powers, or even sometimes or very often political powers also in these big capital cities. Uh, and uh, three cities have more than 10 million inhabitants in Southeast Asia, including Jakarta. Jakarta DKI, uh, not the big metropolitan area we discussed before. So, yeah, okay. Oh, EKI. EKI is okay? Oh, DKI, I always say EKI, I'm sorry, DKI, Daerah Husus Istimewa Jakarta, yeah, of course. I'm sorry, because we've been working about EKN this last day, so I mixed a little bit. <laughs> sorry, sorry, DKY, DKI, okay, thank you. But but Manila is, uh, Manila downtown uh, is bigger still. If we do a little bit more on, on um, and Indonesian cities. So you still see the, the big circle of Jakarta, but uh, also you see that you have many secondary cities and uh, they are more uh, on the coast or uh, near the river estuaries. So because there's a tendency, but which is also a world tendency that the population is concentrated in the coast and the cities are also concentrated in this coast, especially in a maritime country like Indonesia, because then the cities are in relation with uh, maritime flows, uh, sea flows and inland flows. And it is a very strategic location for cities to be at the intersection of uh, sea and land flows. The prime primacy of Jakarta has been growing over time. Sorry, I'm going to just have a small sip of water. Has been growing over time. And because it was the, the primacy index, what we call the four city primacy index, is only you divide the population of the first city with the population of the three following cities. It's only a, a growth way to, to, to measure this uh, over concentration in the capital cities. But in Indonesia, this index has been growing over time. It was only 0.4 in 1890. And it's the last uh, is for 2000, it was already 3.9, 3.09. So it means that the concentration has been increasing in Jakarta capital city, especially because Jakarta also expanded a lot uh, across its boundaries. So let's talk a little more on Jakarta now. And uh, Jakarta is uh, undergoing a process of what we call metropolization. So sorry, as it's a lecture also for a satu, I allow myself to give a definition <laughs> of metropolization. One of the definitions, because there are many, huh? but, but we can consider that the transformation of cities thanks to the internationalization of their economies, this is a process of metropolization, and it brings new activities in the city, new actors, and it transforms social, economic, and spatial pattern of the city. This is... The, a process of metropolization, which is linked to the internationalization of the economies of cities. And it produces sh specific shapes. And the, one of the main characteristic concerning the special pattern of metropolises is the size, the question of size. There's a large 
size of the cities. Metropolises are usually very big cities and the, its population is growing, is expanding very fast because it, they are attractive cities. And the urban area is also expanding very uh, fast within the a process of what we call urban sprawl to overlap the boundaries of the city. But the large size is a question for the city, but also for the projects, the projects that we say produce the cities, because in metropolises, usually um, you find major development real estate operations. Uh, and this is really associated with the internationalization of the urban production uh, also that brings maybe foreign actors of urban promotion. But here in Indonesia, you have also very, very important developers. But also the, the shape of the building is quite, quite sometimes uh, influenced by uh, foreign architecture or the clients for these big developments may be foreign companies, even foreign uh, clients who want to buy in a, in a real estate in Jakarta, for instance. So all this international context leads to this large-scale project or allows large-scale projects. So this is another characteristic for uh, metropolization linked to internationalization of the economy. Well, these are maps produced by your Ministry of Public Work about the expansion of the built environments of uh, this as around in Jakarta. So as long as when, when the city is developed, when the population and activities increase, there, there's beginning to be a kind of land, land pressure in downtown cities. Huh? And then also as the demand is growing high, the, the land price is uh, maybe growing higher. And also the regulation in downtown city may be more uh, more constraint than outside in the peripheries. So there's a tendency that the, the building, the built environment is expanding. So you see here the different dates and that also the, the activities and population increases more rapidly in the peripheries than in the inner city. So this is for BKC 3.44, BKC on the Eastern part. Uh, Depok 4.25, when you know, Jakarta is maybe growing the population only 1.5 maybe percent per year. So uh, this, this is the, the, the urban sprawl that makes metropolises big city and bigger and bigger cities. And the expansion can lead to the formation of um, what we call urbanization corridors. And I just like to make a reference to this Desakota theory. I don't know if you uh, are learning about this, maybe not in the Department of Architecture, but probably in the planning department or geography department. This is a, a kind of theory that explains the, the appearance of urbanization corridor in Asian context, in densely population Asian context. And the Jakarta Bandung urbanization corridor is one of the example um, this, um, this Sakota theory is from Terry McGee, which, who is a, a geographer from New Zealand, and I wrote the definition for you, maybe you can catch the, the presentation later, and uh, it is, it is uh, Terry McGee invented this, this theory uh, according to Southeast Asian context, but it is, it's been used widely, even in our other contexts, so it was interesting because it was developed in Southeast Asian context and especially in Indonesian context because the name is Desa Kota. And it's presupposed that there are um, a particularities of the forms and conditions of current urbanization in the densely settled rice growing areas of what he calls monsoon area, that's Asia. And the formation of this corridor are due to high population densities, which is specific to some areas of Asia, but also of the intensity of the traffic and of the circulation within these densely settled uh, areas, and also the interweaving of rural and urban land use and population structure. And this happens in 
the national rice baskets. Sorry. <coughs> I must stop. Thank you. So uh, this is what uh, Terry McGee uh, explained. Sorry. <laughs> I haven't been lecturing Pong for uh, weeks now, so <laughs> maybe my voice is going down. <laughs> so this is a theory of there's a quota, but I think I will skip because I, I don't, I'm running short of time. But <clears throat> The idea is that the urban and rural air boundaries are blurred, and there's really a, a, a mixity of urban and rural activities and buildings and population in these corridors linking two main uh, cities, for instance, Jakarta and Bandung. So now I'll show you only some, some photographs of your city, so <laughs> I dare to, <laughs> and also some other cities. but. Historically, uh, the, the, the urban landscape in Indonesia was quite low rise because you have, Natalie will talk more about this later, but you have some kind of uh, historical uh, uh, living area in, in Indonesian cities, the Kampong, which has low rise. Huh? Uh, here you see one from the top and with very uh, narrow also road, well, you know, of course, all that. I think today, uh, maybe half of the population of Jakarta is living in such uh, a kampong area and in smaller city more than uh, maybe three quarters of something. So it's a very important uh, shape. And the other historical uh, area or traditional, I mean, is a uh, shop house areas from the Pechinan or the commerce of shop areas with the activity on the low uh, stairs and then the housing in the top. So this is uh, the shop house, Rumatuko now. Uh, this is also the traditional historical huh, of, of it. But now, thanks to the metropolization uh, process, it, there's a tendency that the, the building are higher and higher. As you know, in Jakarta, you have now in the, the Sudirman and all the downtown area, all the high rise building because there are new activities, new demand, new actors coming in. And the, the, the landscape is more like a, a mixed landscape this now with a low rise and high rise buildings and building types. So this is a really a changing pattern of the built environment and also um, economic activity with what we call verticalization of the buildings, which is going with the specialization of uh, the city center activity, which is more and more about tertiary sector, commerce, banking, insurance, services, and so on. So you know Taman Andrek better than I do, <laughs> but I just wanted to, to show this. This is also a, a kind of process of globalization of consumption practice for a, a special uh, part of the population of Jakarta, because we find this all over the world with same brands and everything. And in the peripheries, there are new uh, new towns which are developed. This one is Chitraland with, uh, it, I think it's in, in Surabaya. I'm sorry, I, in Surabaya, because uh, I've studied more about Surabaya, but it is a, a mix of uh, individual housing and then this condominium, but not this high. The, the condominium in downtown are, are higher because the land is so much more expensive, maybe. And also this Ruko, this Ruko uh, area, which is in the suburb of the city because there the land is more available and also the land is cheaper. So you can still develop many kind of new uh, area to work. So it's like a shop house. So the shop is here and then the house is upstairs if you need to. It's a new shop house uh, now, the Ruko and also these huge industrial parks that you find in the peripheries of Jakarta. This is the Sumitomo Corps. So let me conclude. I think I have three minutes left. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> <laughs>
well, one of the conclusions, because this is only really a very simple introduction, and you see that there are many, many subjects to, to research when you're interested in, in metropolization and urban dynamics in Indonesia or in other countries, of course, in other contexts. But what I've shown you is that the, the, the process of metropolization more and more is that the city is more and more produced to answer the needs of modern activities, sometimes international and also middle and upper class inhabitants. I haven't shown you about the transport system, the, the, the highways, the urban highways to accommodate the individual cars. So the modern metropolis is produced and built to accommodate specific activities but also maybe classes of the society more. And also it introduces new center and periphery relations uh, because the city center is becoming more and more uh, specialized in tertiary activities where the industrial one has just uh, uh, settled outside of the city center now. And the landscape is becoming more homogeneous with, with high rising building and um, little estate. While in the peripheries, you have the, the huge now population densities also and new activities that settle in the peripheries. You find new towns, industrial estates. And this is uh, creating these Desakota corridors, urban corridors between two uh, urban centers. Then, Another field of research, but I haven't been taking, talking about, but I think uh, Natalie is more, uh, will talk more about this, is outside for, from this huge urban, uh, urban project and this metropolization process and this modernization of cities linked to internationalization of its economy. What about the ordinary city, ordinary people like uh, us all, you know? And uh, what about this Kampong or the Satpam <laughs> today? Still are, but until when? And we, how will it change? There has been very important programs of uh, Kampong improvement in Jakarta and also the building for also to, to accommodate also every categories of the population. Of course, I haven't been talking about because when the metropolis uh, process, what is more visible is this modernization of the city. But of course, the other people and the other living area and the other activities are still here, of course, and they are part of the process also. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Merci beaucoup pour votre présentation. C'est intéressant. <laughs> well, um, uh, just for remind uh, that she speaks so quick because it was presented for 45 minutes and then now for 30 minutes. So she, you see how quick that she has to explain uh, 32 pages of the materials. Okay, now, Natalie. Yes, because I must. Uh... And that this one, yeah. and then this So, good afternoon to everybody. And first side. Yes, sorry. Uh, I was not very well today. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, no. No, it's not. not after here, after, after, after. No? 
Okay. So, <laughs> so first, I would like to say that it is a great honor to be uh, to be here today, and uh, thank you so much for uh, hosting us. My presentation focuses on the heritage of what we call the ordinary city in Southeast Asia. I am conducting this research with uh, Ibu Ririk Dan Pak Punto from uh, Trisakti University and with other colleagues from Thailand, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam, and from France. For this study, their production and their transformation over time, most often by local residents. So we pay special attention to local knowledge and to non-monumental urban forms which are inherited from the past in contemporary city. Our main research object are merchant and residential neighborhood, villages, compounds, an informal settlement. For each, we are interested in both the built space and the social space. Now I would like to say a few words about the evolution of the heritage approaches in Southeast Asia, because this will explain why was the ordinary city taken into account so late. These urban components have long been neglected, even forgotten, in favor of monuments, palaces, um, temples, monasteries, and so on, and also in favor of urban composition in inherited from agrarian kingdom. Historian researchers have defined have it defined or identified three types of city, the agrarian, merchant, and colonial cities. And the first heritage programs concern only agrarian cities, which were the center on the capitals of agrarian empires located in the rice field areas. These cities were characterized by their monumental and orthogenic composition. They were built in stone, that is to say, in long-lasting materials. On the contrary, the settlement built for the ordinary were built in wood and wood. The slide hasn't moved. Excuse me, please. The slide hasn't moved. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. For example, in Java, the first heritage project focused on the temples of Borobudur, you can see here on the left, on Prambanan, first by the Dutch and then by Indonesian government. Moreover, these temples were the first cultural site inscribed on the World Heritage List in Southeast Asia in 1991. Then the project focused on the historic city, such as Yogyakarta, you can see on the right, the city was founded at the end of the 18th century as the capital of the great Sultanate of Mataram. Elsewhere in Southeast Asia, large urban archaeological sites such as Angkor in Cambodia were recognized as heritage. 
Angkor was classified on the list of World Heritage in 1992. On the left, you can see the large scale and geometrical composition of the Angkorian territory, which extends from the Kulen Mountains in the north to the Tonlesap Lake in the south. On the right, you see one of the main gates of Angkor Thom City. Then later, some programs were developed for the historical royal city that are still inhabited, still alive, such as the royal citadel of Ratanakosing in Bangkok with its palace, temples and monastery surrounded by a concentric system of corners. As you can see, the focus is still on the monumental component related to the monarchy. In the late 1990, heritage focus moved to the merchant city, which I remind you are the second type of cities defined by historians. These cities have introduced a new architectural and urban composition that is to say, the merchant street consisting of shop houses built in long lasting materials. Some merchant cities have been inscribed on the World Heritage List, such as Oyan in Vietnam in 1999, Malacca and Penang in Malaysia in 2008. This slide show, shows a map of Penang and Shop Out Street. So I have tried to show you that the, the evolution of heritage project from monuments and city of agrarian kingdoms or sultanates to colonial merchant city and then to colonial settlement. It is the case of the old town of Jakarta that you know, which was nominated on the tentative list of UNESCO in 2015. The other component of the cities, such as kampung, villages, lanes, and settlement of everyday life are not included in this heritage program. They are not seen. Some say they are invisible, as well as their inhabitants. However, even today, these architectures constitute the majority of the built and living urban space. They are a key part of local history. In recent years, the ordinary city has begun to be taken into account by some actors, often by NGO, that bring together heritage activists, including many architects and urban planners and local residents. Now, I would like to show you some examples of these actions. I will take three examples in three cities of Southeast Asia. Okay. The first example is in Chiang Mai in the north of Thailand. Chiang Mai was planned to be the capital of the Lana Kingdom at the end of the 13th century. The city was located between Doi Sutep Sacred Mountain to the west and Ping River to the east. The pattern of the historical city was shaped by the cosmological axis west-east based on symbolic geography. So Chiang Mai is a sacred city designed on a square plan. It is surrounded by 45 city walls that have been partly rebuilt. The urban complex is oriented relating to the four cardinal directions. One is the main axis West East, and the second one is the North South axis. In the late 19, the city had grown to the east towards the settlement of foreigner and trader, which were uh, not allowed to stay in the square. Yes. This plan of 2010 shows the item recognized as national heritage. They are mainly monastery and temples. It can be seen that they are concentrated in the square city. 
only few of, the, of them are outside. Until recently, the component of the ordinary Chiang Mai city are not a part of heritage. In response to this situation, several actions have been undertaken. I want to tell you about one of them, the Walai district located in the south of the square. Walai is one of the oldest neighborhoods in Chiang Mai. In the 1980, it became known as a famous silver village, but the development of a new artisan center caused its decline. In the early 2000s, the craftsmen created an association cooperative supported by the monks, the municipality of Chiang Mai, and the Faculty of Architecture of Chiang Mai University. The aim was to promote the tangible and intangible heritage of Walai in order to give a new life to the district and to the craft. Several actions were carried out, including an inventory of Walai houses laying on public space. For this survey, the students look at the organization and use of space, the layout of the houses in relation to the organization of the family as shown in, the, as shown in these three uh, family tree. The students pay attention to the qualities of this living heritage and to their capacity to adapt to current urban issues. In the same time, they have promoted the skill of the craftsman. This picture shows the participatory process conducted by teacher and student of the Faculty of Architecture with the monk, inhabitants, and craftsmen. In 2022, Walai became one of the creative districts of Chiang Mai. Then it was involved in the Chiang Mai Design Week. Before ending this example, this slide shows that new projects are ongoing in Chiang Mai. This former ice factory has been transformed into a showplace for local craft named Weave Artisan Society. In the building, there are uh, exhibition space, coffee shop, chocolate industry, working place, and so on. The project leaders explain us that the project name Weave, which means Menomun in Bassa, invokes the idea of weaving artists, craftsmen, local residents, but also young people from Chiang Mai and tourists into a strong and cohesive community. The goal is to change the neighborhood image and to enhance its value and thus to contribute to its preservation by changing its function and role in the city. The idea uh, is not to turn the living neighborhood into a museum, but to support residents in designing appropriate projects for their own house and for shared space. I come to my Second example, which is located in Jakarta, that you know well in central Java. So the city lies between Merapi Sacred Mountain to the north, which is considered the above of guardian spirits, and the Indian Ocean in the south, which is regarded as the home of the Queen of the Southern Sea. This urban location reminds us of Chiang Mai. Both cities are kingdom's capital. The city was designed on a the city was designed on a square plan surrounded by 40 feet, 45 city walls. Its layout is organized by, by the cosmological north-south axis in accordance with local concept and knowledge. The city began to grow to the north along the main road. Foreigner settlements, administrative and commercial centers were construct in this area. As in Chiang Mai, heritage projects are mainly focused on monumental urban elements here associated with the Kraton. We are going to look at the Kampung Chode project. It is interesting, 
interesting for two main reasons. Firstly, it is an informal settlement and therefore very different from the Chiang Mai Walai example. And secondly, the process took place over more than 40 years and involved several types of actors with different strategy. The Kampung in Raid is located in the northeast of Grattan, close to the main road on the Tugu, along the Chode River. The informal settlement developed from the 1950 on a public dump. In the 1980, an improvement and redevelopment project was implemented by Bapak Mangunwichaya, known as Pakromo. You may have heard of him. He was an architect, a teacher at UGM University, and also an activist such as Catholic priest. Mangun Wijaya objective was threefold. Firstly, he wanted to improve housing and living conditions. To this end, he created prototypes of Javanese houses adapted to the riverbank. Secondly, he aimed to empower the inhabitants agency, that is to say, their collective capacity of action on negotiation. For this purpose, he created a cooperative and he developed Gotong Royong activities to increase the community spirit. And thirdly, he wanted to improve the image of the Kampung in the city, which was considered as a daylight time. The project received the Aga Khan Award in the 1992. This recognition had a strong impact on Kampung Chode community and beyond. Kampung Chode was no longer seen as a slum, but it was still not included in Jochakapta planning. Since then, academics from UGM and Heritage Association have been working with the inhabitants of the Kampung to support the community and to enhance their living space. Together, they made architectural projects. They improved the riverbank landscape. They developed activities for the people of Jakarta and for the tourists. And today, they are proud of their neighborhood. Little by little, the Kampung is being recognized as an urban component of it in its own right. At the end of 2022, the riverbank area was presented as a Kawasan Wizata. What is interesting in this case is that Chode, Kampung Chode has come out of Daira Itam through the collective action of its inhabitants and through tourism development. The last example is located in Hanoi in Vietnam. This plan from 1902 showed that the historical cities composed of the three urban models already mentioned. Firstly, sorry. First, the Tan Long Imperial Citadel, which was built at the in the 11th century. It was the center of political and administrative power. The citadel was inscribed in, on the World Heritage List in 2010. Then the merchant city called the 36th Street neighborhood. It was developed in the 15th century between the citadel and the Red River near the port. This is the quarter I am going to talk about. And lastly, the colonial settlement built in the south of the 36th street between the Red River and the Citadel. The town expanded from this historical core, first to the south and then to the surrounding villages and rural areas. Let's look at the 36th street neighborhood. Its urban morphology is characterized by the smallness of its parcel division and by the very height built on population densities. The area is organized by narrow street of four to eight wide, which enclose large blocks. These blocks are divided into narrow plots that run deep into the blocks. These plots can be 
five to four meters wide and some 100 meters long or more. The buildings are of chop houses, which have a commercial activity on the ground floor open to the street and residential activity on the upper floor. The interaction between the shop house and the street are intense and diverse, depending on the time of day and night. The alleyways is a place are a place of business, but residents also treat their doorstep on street as a part or as an extension of their own home. As a result, Various domestic activities, such as cooking, doing one's laundry, installing ornamental plants, or burning votive objects, take place in the alleyway. Several kinds of conservation and valorization projects are carried out in this place. Three types can be defined. Firstly, here, Uh, yes, uh, here we see a project to improve a street facade that has been done by the municipality of Hanoi. The shop house facade has been renovated as well as the street layout. The aim was to improve their aesthetic qualities by standardizing their composition the colors of the shop houses and the street furniture. If at first the street may have looked a little fake, the activity soon recovered and the project seems to be a success. The second project was the conservation of the shop houses. It resulted from a cooperation between the municipality of Hanoi and the city of Toulouse in France. The shop house have been renovated to its presumed original state, probably at the beginning of the 20th century. It is currently used as a museum and a restaurant. And so the third type of project are those carried out by the inhabitants themselves who adapt their shop houses to accommodate new function as hotel, restaurant, cafe, co-working place. They try to keep the ambiance, the spirit of the shop house on the street, which is now a tourist attraction while renewing their function and use. These three examples, in these three examples, the shop houses project have become a model for local residents. They have been the inspiration for several other projects that spread through the neighborhood. So in conclusion, these case studies have shown the diversity of the component of the ordinary city and also the diversity of the heritage approaches undertaken. I would like to underline that this project supported by different type of actors which different objectives are complementary. They influence each other. The design are emitted, reproduced, transformed. In this way, the heritage of the ordinary city can develop further. These examples have also confirmed that urban inhabitants are not passive actors of the city production. On the contrary, they are key players in the, in the renewal of the built and social space of everyday life. As architects, we can learn from this ordinary heritage, which are adapted to the local way of life, and also to the geographical and historical context. We believe that they can cope with current challenges and their inhabitants still have a role to play in urban production. So at the end of this uh, presentation, I hope to have motivated you to study the ordinary city and its architecture. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, 
Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Okay, we notice that uh, two speakers speak uh, very interesting topics. One is about contemporary urbanization and one is about concerning on heritage uh, in urbanization. So, um, <clears throat> Now it's a question and answer session. Uh, please, uh, for audience, uh, if they, you want to ask. Yeah. But <clears throat> uh, Brian, could you help me uh, with Mr. Bambang for the mic? Thank you. Halo, uh, Ibu Manuel dan uh, Ibu Natali. In Indonesia or in English or because I can speak in France. In English so they can understand directly if it's possible. Dua-duanya bisa bahasa Indonesia sebetulnya. <laughs> okay. But it's all up to you. Yeah. Uh, my, I have two questions for Natalie and for Ibu Manuel. Yeah. Uh, my question uh, about demography uh, as a concern of uh, plan planning. Eh? But in my university, uh, right now, with the planning institution not come from growth of demography as as some cities like also, also like that not because uh, we calculate demography but because of uh, physical growth and some and some something like that right <laughs> also in my university because i also teach in planology uh, that will be our concentration, especially in planology, because Jakarta it will be uh, live it by people, because IKN then some ASN go there. Uh, it will be problem. I mean, for Bapenas at least, uh, thinking that is it about economic problem. It, uh, it will be happen with economic of Jakarta City for the uh, next year or maybe next decade. Do you have experience about this kind of research? Because till now, I can submit anything to Babanas to think about this. It's very difficult to predict what about Jakarta after uh, finish with the title of DKI? First for Mr. For Ibu Mola, Ibu Manuel, for my friends, <laughs> Natalie, uh, great, you still blusuan. Yeah. Lusuan is uh, go to the desa desa, go to the village, urban village. Yeah, you still research about that. Great, really, I, I really appreciate of you. Yeah, uh, like my president, it's called blusuan. It's called blusuan. Blusuan uh, to the village or urban village. <laughs> Maybe uh, Ibu Ratna is, can translate, translate in French of, about Blue Suan. Our concentration is about my, uh, about this you are the question, uh, question of research is what about in urban villas 
after they got a billion, a billion every year after presidency of Jokowi, every village. Yeah, they got a billion. What happened with the urban villas or with the village? In Flores, it will be problem because they have nothing about uh, accounting, yeah. about accounting to responsible of this project. One billion a year. If presidency five year, they got five billion yes. in presidency. Uh, five billion of what is budget, budget, dana desa. Uh, rupias, rupias. Yeah, rupias. Yeah, dana desa. Development of desa. Oh, yeah, because it, yeah, because uh, feel free to to use the budget. Yeah. Uh, maybe this for Natalie. I mean, uh, what do you see about the? What you see about the the result of the budget in <laughs> Indonesia? Sorry, actually, should should my knowledge, but I have very difficult to catch up about that, especially in my research field in Flores. I can see about the growth of of uh, Willards of Flores because they just give me a report. Thank you. Uh, Ibu, Thank you, uh, Ibu uh, Bambang. Do you want to directly answer? Okay, yeah, it's on. Thank <clears throat> you. Yeah, it's on. Thank you very much for your uh, question. Is it done? Okay, thank you very much for your question. It's a very difficult question because it's a question of perspective. So I'm not, uh, you know, <laughs> I don't know. But the project for the new capital city is to move ASN to civil servants, but also that the new capital city and its area become a new hub for economic activity. So you seem to fear that the activity is going to decrease in Jakarta if it increases in uh, in Kalimantan. This is this is a uh, well I don't know <laughs> because this will be the project for the new capital city, which is called IKN. is is a project until the year two thousand and forty five. So it will take a long long time before it can the city itself will develop for. Us, uh, ministries, the president palace, and for civil servant. And then the other developments for economic activity will take a more, the second or third step, a more longer time. So I cannot say what will happen until 2000, uh, 2045. But what I see is uh, Jakarta is a very vibrant city, very dynamic, many, many. I hadn't been there here for 15 years in Jakarta and I, I found so many changes and also the, the economic activity is changing very fast in Jakarta also. And I, I cannot believe that this will decrease because it is so dynamic and so lively and there are so many new projects. Uh, even even developers continue to develop new areas of new new living areas in Jakarta, uh, even in the north of Jakarta. Even though we know that the city is sinking and that the floods will come on the north coast, but still there are new still new development uh, in this area. So I think that um, people here they believe that the city will just. Continue continue to go on and, uh, and on the other side it will probably take a quite long time to bring a lot of economic activity in in Kalimantan because until now it's more on 
natural resources, uh, very few industry until now, except for oil and gas and also palm oil or this kind of, uh, of activity, which is commodity based. So to introduce some uh, transformation industry, industry in Bengalahan, it may, might be take some time. I'm, I'm sure that all the infrastructures and everything will be ready for to to uh, to to have these activities coming in. But then the private investors also have to decide to settle their factory in Kalimantan rather than in Jakarta. So I, I cannot say what will happen. But for now, I think Jakarta is a so dynamic city that I can't believe it will go lower because. Maybe uh, 100,000 civil servants are moving fastly, but then still the economic activity will remain. And if we compare, for, existence, for instance, with uh, Vietnam, where you have kind of political uh, and administrative uh, Ibukota in Hanoi, and then the economic uh, capital city from Ho Chi Minh City that kind of divide between the, the two functions. So. Maybe this could be also what will happen in, in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, with your permission, uh, Natalie and Manuel, would uh, the audience get the material from your presentation? Okay, don't begin counting, Sharia. Thank you. Only, uh, I'm <clears throat> sorry if so, for some slide I forgot to mention the source, please. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, we must really may always mention the source. So maybe we will add the sources yeah. all complete and then we will send. I promise we'll yes. send, but really for our colleagues who we shoot the maps or the photos, yes. we should. Okay, then the basically uh, it's okay to share, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, so we will wait for the editing of the names. All right. <clears throat> Okay, another question, maybe from the uh, online audience, or maybe students in here. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, okay, uh, maybe Natalie, uh, maybe, maybe you want to uh, answer? Yes, uh, I don't know if I want to answer because it's a very difficult question. <laughs> <laughs> what happened with the delay during the last? Uh, five years or uh, it's difficult because you you know that during the last three four years it was impossible to come to indonesia so i didn't have the opportunity to go in the village to go in different parts of indonesia it's the first no the second time i come back to indonesia uh, after uh, corona so what i can see what i can say maybe about the ordinary city but not only in indonesia as i try to show you in Thailand and Indonesia too. It's um, that's uh, more and more um, ac uh, academic stakeholder and more and more uh, inhabitants are really interested by uh, the, the heritage of the ordinary city. And we can, uh, I could have uh, mentioned uh, many uh, example, uh, many case studies uh, we are, uh, we, are uh, big, uh, we are doing um, starting a new uh, research on LASEM with uh, Ibu Redik and Pat, Pat Punto. And uh, I think that the interest for the heritage of uh, villages uh, is growing, but uh, it's uh, still uh, very few. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did 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 uh, they bilangnya belum tidak bisa menjawab lebih detail. <laughs> no, uh, he asked about the response to the response. I don't know. Dia tidak tahu. Dia tidak bisa Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe who wants to uh, ask? Yeah, ya, ibu silakan. Tadi mic-nya. <laughs> Thank you very much for Manuel and Natalie uh, for your lecture. It's very thoughtful. Uh, uh, maybe this time I'll, I will ask a very uh, easy question for you. <laughs> uh, 
for manual um well uh jakarta our biggest city and but in our perspective uh, the the development of jakarta is not very ideal it tend to be uh disorderly and uh and and it's more org or organically uh sprawling yeah uh, so what do you think uh, the the special of Jakarta of the development of Jakarta uh, or maybe the the urbanization of Jakarta uh, maybe comparing with the other city um, let's say Paris maybe <laughs> so 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 what the special of Jakarta according to your study yeah and for for Natalie um uh what is your criteria for for ordinary city and and uh what's the special about the heritage in ordinary city uh, maybe compared to 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 the unordinary city maybe uh, how's how's uh how's the difference of uh, or, uh heritage in ordinary city and in like Yogyakarta, maybe Lhasem, or maybe Chiang Mai, uh, compared to the other unordinary city <laughs> in your criteria, like maybe in Jakarta, we have Kota Tua, and also uh, maybe in Thailand, uh, compared Chiang Mai to Bangkok. So what's the space of, what's the difference? Uh, I think that's easy for you. Thank you very much. Terima kasih. Well, thank you for your for your questions. <laughs> if I may, yes, yes, yes. Maybe for the, the Jakarta one, of course, the development in Jakarta is not ideal one, <laughs> of course. I, I find it very dynamic and lively, but maybe it's difficult to live here every day <laughs> because of the traffic, the pollution, the flood. So, of course, I know, but <laughs> I know a lot of problems, but if when economic activity is concerned it seems very very uh, concentrated here in jakarta so that's what i i meant before but of course it is not ideal on a planning point of view and well i'm not a, a, an urban planner but uh, i see that maybe one of the big problems probably many including water problem and flood and also everything but the the infrastructure uh, problem and the public transport it's it's really uh, probably a, a very big problem because the city is expanding the built environment is expanding overlaps the boundaries but then the public transport system is just running behind the extension of the built environment so it's become very difficult to to, to circulate uh, in the city and maybe this is a uh, one of the the problems that I see if compared to Paris, for example. But Paris has uh, the most dense uh, underground metro uh, system. We have how many lines? Maybe 14 lines of metro, north, south, everything. It's very dense, more denser than in London, for instance. And, and it allows the city to, to, to grow and still people can have access to downtown, the center of the city, because they can still use the public transport system. So when, when you talk about planning, you have many uh, different uh, questions that you have to address. But uh, this one of public transportation seems to me quite, quite urgent. And it's very late in Jakarta if compared to Bangkok, for instance. But same in Manila. So <laughs> thank you. Maybe uh, maybe I will ask to to to, to do Manuel to, to speak in English. It will be easier. What yeah? What what she means by ordinary uh, city is a city which is produced by its own inhabitants and not by outside actors. And the city, ordinary city, reproduces the oof, knowledge. Knowledge, yes, traditional uh, knowledge. 
of the inhabitants and tries to use it and reproduce this knowledge. And in heritage programs, this uh, local and traditional knowledge are not taken into account, never. And maybe, yes, I try to speak in English. Yes. And maybe it will be better to speak about the ordinary uh, neighborhood in the city because uh, all the city, uh, um, even the, uh, Jakarta, Bangkok, Chiang Mai, and, and so on, uh, have their own uh, ordinary neighborhood. So uh, there are some part of Jakarta with uh, ordinary uh, kampung, ordinary uh, um, areas. Yes, I think so. Yes, yes. Um, what is um, take into account in ordinary city or project is not the monuments or the the main uh, composition of the city, but the uh, or the building the and of everyday life on the practices of uh, everyday life. Thank you. <laughs> So, because time is uh, running out, so uh, do you want to add uh, the answers? Is it final? Really? Okay, thank you. So, uh, in in a brief that I can give a conclusion, uh, in defining urban area, we need to understand definition of urban and application of the right methodology. In giving definition, we need to make criteria where involving time frame, inhabitants, facilities, and geography boundary. And each country has its own criteria to define urban. As in Indonesia, the context is a desa kota. That's what you said, right? And then for uh, Natalie, um, she speaks about ordinary city where it sees the life of a local people and starting with a uh, the heritage that they have and also the way of their live uh, seeing from tangible and intangible way. And in the big city, there's also like ordinary areas. So ordinary, it's not only ordinary city, but can be also applied in the big cities. Is that the conclusion? All right, then. Okay, so um, thank you very much. Uh, so this is the discussion that we've uh, done today and uh, give back to the MC. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please give applause, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to Professor Manuel, Dr. Natalie, and also Dr. Retna. Okay, so you may head him back to your seat. And before we close this international guest lecture officially, we once again would like to invite all participants who are attending offline and also online to have a photo session. And therefore, uh, maybe two speakers, moderators, you may heading into the center and also we'd like to invite Bapak Dekan and also all vice deans, head and secretary department, all lecturers and students, all participants, please come up to the front for having the photo session again. And also we'd like to invite all the online participants from Zoom. So would you please to turn on your camera? Okay, so please welcome ladies and gentlemen. All right, so while we are preparing for the offline participants, so maybe you would like to start with the online participant first. Okay, so uh, how many slides do we have? Three, okay, three slides. So please welcome, Madam. Okay, yeah, Bapak Dekan, please, yeah. Please, all lecturers and all students, so please welcome. All right, so yeah, we have three slides. Okay, ready for the first slide? Okay, ready, ladies and gentlemen in Zoom? Okay, on my count in three, two, one. Okay, all set for the second page. Okay, second slide. Okay, in three, two, one. All right, all set. And for the last slide, okay, the third slide, please. Okay, wait a second. Okay, ready, Mas Rizal? Yeah. All right, in three, two, one. Okay, that's right. Thank you very much for online participants. Okay, so now we are preparing for the 
offline participants for having the photo session. And please, maybe Mas Dwi from Humas to arrange the position for some stuff. Okay. Thank you very much once again. Thank you to all honorable guests and all board of FTSP Universitas Trisakti and all participants who are attending offline and online. So this is the end of the international guest lecture presented by FTSP Universitas Trisakti. I'm Prayang Sani on behalf of the committee would like to say thank you so much and we are apologize for any inconvenience and wishing you all the best for the next journey and Wishing you, we can, uh, we hope we can meet in, uh, in another occasion. All right. So last but not least, we'd like to say wabillahi taufiq wal hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Good afternoon. Au revoir. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you.